Now, once again, we're happy to have this privilege to come into your home for a few minutes and study with you out of the Word of God. And, of course, our teacher is the Holy Spirit. No prophecy of the Scriptures of any private interpretation, Paul says. And when we study, we must compare spiritual things with things spiritual, search the Scriptures as the Bereans, rightly divide the Word of Truth as Paul has spoken, and believe what God said as he said it in the context in which the words are found. We're studying here about the messages to the seven churches in Asia Minor, and from volume two of this series, you may gather, that here we have a picture of the church age. The first church in the church age is called the church at Ephesus and represents the early church of 33 to 100 A.D. Then we get into the next church epistle, Revelation chapter 2, verse 8, which deals with a later period of church history, representing a time from around 100 A.D. to 325. And, of course, we've discussed this matter in the previous volumes. The last admonition written to the church at Ephesus is a promise, To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And if one will compare this with the final admonition in Revelation chapter 22, for those who keep the Lord's commandments, Revelation 22, 14, one will see that the doctrinal import The doctrinal import of the passage is to an overcomer in the tribulation. The born-again child of God in this age has no need of eating of the tree of life, for he already has obtained eternal life through the Lord Jesus Christ. John has written, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life. He says again, He that hath the Son hath life. So we don't need the tree. Uh, speaking inspirationally of the passage, to him that overcometh, all Christians have overcome, and this is clear from 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, and 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. And having overcome, we can partake of the tree of life in the third heaven, if we so please, if it pleases us. However, as far as our eternal life is concerned, we have that in Jesus Christ. Now, in the next period of church history, we find the church represented by the word Smyrna. Under the angel of the church in Smyrna write. And for the comments on the angel of the churches, see our volume 2, and listen to the comments and study the material found on side 2 of that volume. The church of Smyrna, the word Smyrna means myrrh. And as anyone who studies the Bible knows, myrrh is a picture of bitterness and suffering. The Lord Jesus Christ has this gift brought to him at his birth. And the song of the wise men says, Myrrh is mine, its bitter perfume, breathes a life of gathering gloom, sorrowing, sighing, bleeding, dying, sealed in the stone-cold tomb. It is myrrh that is brought to the Lord Jesus Christ at the time of his burial. It represents the suffering prophet. So this church is plainly a suffering church. And perhaps no church in the history of the church ever suffered like the church did between 100 and 325 A.D. This is the church that suffers under the ten imperial persecutions, which may be prefigured by the statement in verse 10, you shall have tribulation ten days. This is the church that uh, put up and suffered with the Roman emperors from the time of Domitian right up to the time of Constantine. And this church was burned at the stake thrown to the lions in the arena, trampled to death by wild bulls, put in leather bags with rattlesnakes, sewed up and thrown in the river. If you want to read the history of this glorious church, you should read the ecclesiastical history by Eusebius, and especially the excerpts which are still preserved today in the work called Fox's Book of Martyrs, edited by Forbush, F-O-R-B-U-S-H. This was a glorious church, and they earned their crown. He says about this church, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Verse 10. The conscientious student of Scripture should observe that crowns are given as rewards. Nowhere in the Scripture does he say, If you are faithful unto death, I will give you eternal life. The gift of God is eternal life. But the crown of life is an earned reward for being faithful. And we should always observe this distinction. There are crowns that are mentioned throughout the Bible the incorruptible crown of 1 Corinthians chapter 9, the crown of glory, 1 Peter chapter 5, the crown of righteousness, 2 Timothy chapter 4, the crown of rejoicing, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and the crown of life mentioned here and in James. 
which are given out as rewards for service. Eternal life is the free gift of the grace of God freely given. This church is a martyr church, as we have said before, and it is during the time of this church that the greatest efforts are made to overthrow the church possible by people within the church. Notice the peculiar warning in verse 9, I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan a very peculiar expression, and yet not so peculiar to the man who takes time out to study church history. Now any reliable church history, such as the one by Newman, the Baptist historian, or the one by Philip Schaff, the Reformed historian, or the one by La Touré, or even Dollinger, the Catholic historian, any reliable history will tell you exactly what happened in this period. For this is the period that spawned forth, perhaps, the greatest destructive critic of the Bible who ever lived. And it was not Celsus or Porphyry, two atheists at this time. It was a man named Origen who took over the pagan school of Greek philosophy in Alexandria, Egypt. Origen, 184 to 254 A.D., is responsible for perhaps more false teaching in the body of Christ than any other man that ever lived outside of possibly Augustine, and Jerome. Now these men are worshipped in most circles that deal with Christian education because they were scholars, and yet these men are some of the most dangerous men who ever lived. All three of these men, and I might add John Calvin, Dabney, Kuyper, Hodge, Philip Schaff, Davidson, Meyer, Ellicott, Tischendorf, Westcott and Hort, Pamphilus, and several more. All of these men believed that God was all through with the Jews and that they, the Christians, were the Jews who replaced the nation of Israel. Now this teaching is called Ah Millennialism or Post Millennialism and it deals with the reign of Christ on this earth. The proof texts for this heresy are found in the book of Romans chapter 2 where he speaks about a spiritual Jew in distinction from a physical Jew, and in Galatians chapter 3, where the Christian is said to be a spiritual child of Abraham. Now the men who constructed this great blasphemy against the Holy Spirit and the body of Christ all believed that any verse, listen to me carefully, any verse in the Old Testament that dealt with literal promises promised to the literal, physical, visible nation of Israel as a political unity were to be spiritualized and taught as an allegory and applied to the body of Christ. The outstanding example of this heresy is found in the Amplified New Testament, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, where the corrupt scribe has written that God is all through with the Jew forever. Serious students of the Bible who have the authorized text of the King James know perfectly well from reading Romans chapter 11 that God is not all through with Israel and further that a man who teaches this is ignorant and conceited. Paul warned the Gentile believers and said, Brethren, I would not have you be wise in your own conceit. Be not ignorant of this mystery that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, and then all Israel shall be saved, for the deliverer shall come out of Zion and turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Hebrews chapter 8, Jeremiah chapter 30, Jeremiah chapter 33, Isaiah chapter 11, Isaiah chapter 65 and 66, and much of the books of Hosea, Joel, and Amos deal with a literal, physical, visible restoration of the nation of Israel and their spiritual conversion to the true Messiah. But in the Smyrna period of church history, at the time of Origen, Pamphilus, Philo, Clement, Irenaeus, Tertullian, Justin Martyr, Clement of Alexandria, Clement of Rome, and Eusebius, this basic 
fundamental Bible truth was rejected. And in its place, the Christians were taught that they were the true Jew. They said they were Jews and were not. And the Bible says of this class of people, they are of the synagogue of Satan. One of these men in Timothy was teaching the resurrection was past already and had spiritualized the first resurrection. His name was Hymenaeus. And Paul said this man was delivered to Satan. We are told in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and 6 that when a man is delivered to Satan, he is turned over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. And these words, of course, were written to Christians, not unsaved people. But Hymenaeus, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 17 and 18, was teaching the resurrection is past already, over and done with, and Hymenaeus himself, for teaching that, was turned over to the devil. Did you notice that? In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 20, turned over to Satan, what for, Paul? That they may learn not to blaspheme. Our text says, I know the blasphemy of them, which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. So during this period of church history, one of the most pernicious forms of blasphemy and heresy the church has ever seen arises, and it is preserved throughout the institutions of Christian education for the next 18 centuries. Nearly every commentator in the pulpit commentary, 22 volumes, is of this class. And the Greek text put out by Westcott and Hort and Nestles was put out by men who rejected the literal, physical, visible restoration of Israel to their literal, physical, visible land and their conversion to Christ at his advent. This false teaching arises in the period of church history before 325 A.D. and Augustine, a Platonic philosopher made much of in Christian circles, Aurelius Augustine writes a book called The City of God after 325 A.D., which teaches that Rome is the new Jerusalem and that the kingdom is gradually spreading across this earth inside church buildings as people partake of Christ through the Lord's Supper. This is what is known as evolutionary ubiquity, a doctrine taught by an unsaved heathen Greek philosopher 400 years before the times of John the Baptist. I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Then he tells this bunch to hold out faithful, and he tells them, He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Since every Christian is an overcomer, 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, and 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, we don't have to worry about the second death. Then in chapter 2, verse 12, the fat hits the fire, as the expression goes, or as the hunters say in Alabama, that tied the rag on the bush. For the word Pergamos here in verse 12 means much marriage. And this pictures the church age from 325 A.D., the Council of Nicaea, to 500 A.D., the time of Pope Gregory the Great. You say, well, now where do you get all that from? Well, if you go back to volume two and review the remarks and our study, you'll see that these chapters, chapter two and chapter three, are addressed to a church and churches that disappear in chapter four and are never heard of again. You'll also discover that the order of these churches is significant because the first one is a perfect church except it's lost its motive for service and the last church is completely apostate and receives nothing but condemnation. These are then plainly representative of the beginning and end of the period of church history. And each church matches a certain period. It was in 325, uh, it was in 325, uh, it was in 325, uh, it was in the edict that uh, Constantine passed in 313, the edict of Milan. 
It was in 325 that the church settled down with the world and became married to the world and joined with the world. Any student of church history knows this. And any reliable church historian will give the whole matter in detail where you couldn't possibly miss it. Constantine never even was baptized until he was on his deathbed, and then he was sprinkled, not baptized. And in his profession of faith, he retained Easter bunnies, Christmas trees, wedding rings, heathen processions, and anybody who knows anything about Constantine knows that his motive was more political than religious. He joined the eastern and western half of his empire and won ecumenical United, United Nations by adopting the Christian religion as the official religion while allowing the heathen and pagan people to retain their religions. Constantine's religion then was and is and shall remain a peculiar conglomeration of Babylonian mythology, pagan Greek and Roman mystery religions, and Christianity mixed together. It is the leaven spoken of in Matthew 13, which a woman, Matthew 13, hid in a lump of meal till the whole lump was leavened. And we shall meet this lady again, for she is described in detail in Revelation chapter 17, verse 1 through verse 10. So this church period represents the time that the church settled down in the world. And those of you who know church history, you know that in 487, the priesthood moved from Pergamos and the Babylonian priesthood and moved west. And as a matter of fact, in 133 B.C., they had a Roman pontiff in Rome that adopted the mystical practices of the mystical brotherhood of Babylon. And Caesar was made a pontiff over this uh, mystical brotherhood. In 366 A.D., uh, Bishop Damasus was made head of it by a college of monks. And in 381, they began to accept the heathen rites in the name of Christ. This Babylonian mystical brotherhood of these mist religions passes from Babylon to Pergamos in 487 B.C. and passes from there to Rome. Hence a peculiar saying in Revelation chapter 2, verse 13, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days where Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwells. Now this church has joined hands with the world, settled down the world. It has truly become all things to all men, by all means it might damn some. It has compassed land and sea to make one proselyte, and has made him twofold more the child of hell than itself. And it is teaching the doctrine of Balaam, verse 14, that you can, uh, you know, hunt with the hounds and run with the rabbits. That's the idea. Some of the people held you could uh, be a real Christian and yet live like the world. Or as Billy Sunday used to say, if there's such a thing as a worldly Christian, there must be such a thing as a heavenly devil. And probably a lot of truth in that. They taught the doctrine of Balaam, verse 14, and the student who will take time out to study Numbers 23 and 25 we'll find the doctrine of Balaam was to teach the children of Israel to intermarry with the Moabites, and the Moabites to intermarry with them, so the children of Israel would sign their unborn children over to another religion and pick up the Moabite religion, which included fornication, verse 14, as part of the worship service. See that in Numbers chapter 25 specifically. Now this great Balaam religion, this doctrine of Baal and Balaam, is found throughout the Old Testament. It is represented by Balak, the false king, a type of the Antichrist. Balaam, the false prophet, a type of the false prophet in the tribulation. And the false god Baal, who of course represents the dragon or false devil of Revelation chapter 12 and 13. This is a satanic trinity represented by names that begin with B. Hence the peculiar coincidence that no book in the Bible begins with B. And 85% of the proper names, such as Belial, Beelzebub, Baal, Balaam, Balak, have a bad connotation. Fornication in the ancient pagan religions, especially the religions of Phoenician Babylon, incorporated immorality as part of the worship service. 
And that is why in the next 10 or 20 years, the worship services in America will degenerate into sex orgies. Now that may sound rather strong to your ears, but I said the same thing on tapes made 19 years ago. 19 years. And in 19 years, things have progressed, as Darwin would say, remarkably. Remarkably. Now the thinking behind this is very cultured and sophisticated. And the way you go back to jungle religions with fornication, dope, drugs, and maniacal dancing, while professing to be civilized, is done through education. You simply change the terminology. If I were to tell you the worship service in the largest cathedrals in America in 20 years will be sex orgies with nude dancers and African dance bands, you might accuse me of overstatement. But you see, I know educators. I've been exposed. I realize it didn't take very well. But I've been exposed. And here's how the thinking goes. Number one, God is love. That's the first creed of an unsaved man. He knows nothing about a God of wrath. He knows nothing about our God as a jealous God. He knows nothing about vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. He knows nothing about our God as a consuming fire. God to an unsaved educated man, if he's there at all, is just a great big kiss, as Joseph Parker used to say in sarcasm. If God is love, and God is the author of life, then human love is a manifestation of God. Love your neighbor as yourself. Therefore, since man is capable of manifesting God's love to his fellow man, man himself is God-like. Therefore, if one of God's main functions is creator, to create life, Man inherits this godlike quality, so he is the creator of life. By such reasoning, the human act of procreation gets to have a religious significance or connotation, hence reverence for life, love of life, which will eventually terminate in the worship of human life. And involved in this is the male and female principle. And this is very apparent by what happens in verse 20 of Revelation 2.20. Balaam, having showed up in verse 14, is accompanied by Jezebel in verse 20. And if you will compare verse 20 with verse 14, you will find that Jezebel's religion was the same religion of Balak, Baal, and Balaam. Immorality as part of the worship service. And this is why the 144,000 saved in the tribulation, see Revelation chapter 14, are said to be virgins. They are not merely spiritually pure, having abstained from pollutions of idols. They are pure physically, having abstained from the modern form of worship, which will shortly come into America, sex, as the highest good, sex, as the greatest God, sex as a manifestation of life and love, sex written over, beyond, above, and through all, and promoted mainly by the National Education Association, SECUS, and the Health Education Welfare Board. That's the handwriting on the wall. It's not a pretty piece of handwriting. But you can read it. It's not hieroglyphics. And so this church settles down the world and goes to pot, and the people that go along with this church stay in that condition, verse 22, until the end of the church age. This church here was condemned. And even though it still had martyrs, verse 13, it had picked up the doctrines of Balaam and Balak and was fooling around with immorality. And verse 15, it had accepted the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. It had developed a church clergy hierarchy that rule over the laity, that dressed different from the congregation, that acted different from the congregation, that went by a different set of rules and sought to rule the world through religious means. This is the joining of church and state from which America 
until World War II was comparatively free. And here we close side one of volume three in Revelation chapter two at verse 16. On the reverse side of this volume, side two, we'll take up the study in Revelation chapter two, verse 17. Now we were studying the material in Revelation chapter 2 dealing with the church at Pergamos, which of course represents the church age at the time of Constantine the Great, Eusebius, and continuing there up to the time of Pope Gregory the Great around 500. Our next church letter is given to the church at Thyatira, verse 18, which represents the history of the church as a body from 500 AD to about 1000 into the middle of the so-called Dark Ages. And one can see that these churches are in pitiful shape by the descriptions given. And we have commented already upon the doctrine of Balaam under Pergamos. And now we run into the doctrine of Jezebel in verse 20, which of course is much along the same line. Now there's no time in a few brief recordings like this to cover everything completely. But to the interested student of the Word of God, we would suggest that he give careful attention to the material found in the last six chapters in the book of Judges and the material found in 1 Kings 18 and 19, and the material found in Jeremiah chapter 38 to chapter 45. All of these chapters speak of a universal religion that went out from Phoenicia, whose origin was in Babylon. And this universal religion, which seeks universal dominion, is described in detail in these passages and all things appertaining to it. The church at Thyatira is a church that is suffering the odor of affliction, for this is what the word means. This church is going through it, as the expression goes, and uh, this church is commended for its faith and works and charity and its service. This church is warned to stay away from Jezebel and her doctrine, and it is warned about uh, any doctrine that came from her as coming from the depths of Satan, verse 24. This church is told to continue on and overcome and keep the Lord at work to the end. And if this is so, the Lord will give this church a position of reigning in the time of the millennium. He that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of the potter shall be broken in shivers, even as I have received of my Father. The reference is to Psalm 2.9, where the Lord Jesus Christ returned to set up a military dictatorship over this earth, called a reign of a rod of iron. Uh, this church here is going along on one leg, so to speak, and they have uh, some good teeth, but some ailing molars are going to infect the whole mouth, and the admonitions aimed at it are pretty pointed. Verse 20 and 21, 22 and 23. This church here sees the Latin Vulgate of Jerome come into circulation to replace the Byzantine text of the Greek church. It sees the book of St. Augustine on the City of God, adopted by Charlemagne, Clovis, and Pepin, and other secular rulers. They sought to maintain the Holy Roman Empire for the popes. And this period here is the period of deepest depravity, degradation, and demoniac influence in the entire history of mankind. It is a strange fact, but the deepest, darkest period of history the world has ever known, 500 to 1500, called the Dark Ages was the time in which the church ran the political empires of this world. Evidently, the church has no business fooling with politics because the only time the church was in the driver's seat, it was called the Dark Ages. And this should be a lesson for unsaved people as well as saved people alike. There shouldn't be any mistake about it. This is the period that saw uh, Charlemagne, and they saw the rise of Muhammad, and the terrible battles between the uh, conflicting and opposing states in Europe. He saw the political chicanery of Rome, trying to keep the balance of power, and set the princes against each other, pleading now religious immunity uh, during political fights, and then pleading political immunity when religious controversy came up. During this period, the Lord had some faithful people who kept right on through with the Word of God, these people are called Paulicians, Wild Engines, Albigensians, 
and they keep preaching the word and they preserve the true text of the Bible right through this period. None of them fool with Jerome's Latin Vulgate. They had their own Latin, which is called the Old Itala. The Old Itala, of course, is the basis for the English translations in England, and it is the Texas Receptus of the Greek text from which your King James Bible is translated. On they go through the church age into chapter 3, and in chapter 3 we find the church of Sardis. The word Sardis means the red ones. And this church here was, uh, well, it was growing in membership, but its members weren't growing. And he says about this church at Sardis, he said, uh, uh, Be watchful, strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. This church has a few names that are uh, worthy, and they haven't defiled their garments, verse 4, and they exhorted to overcome. And they're given the promise that if they overcome, they'll not be blotted out of the book of life. The Christian, of course, in this age doesn't have to worry about that because he has overcome, according to 1 John 5, 4, 1 John 4, 4, so Revelation 3, 5 for the Christian is a promise rather than a threat. The reader may notice the peculiar, uh, contradictory way in which God speaks of things in these passages. You will notice the church in Smyrna said that it was poor. I know thy poverty. And yet he said it was a rich church. Conversely, a church in, in Revelation chapter 3, verse 17, says, I am rich. And the Lord says about that church, you're poor, wretched, miserable, naked, and blind. So often the local church deceives itself about its true condition, just as the Christian deceives himself about his true condition. We must always remember that man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. The church at Sardis is suffering from 1000 to 1500 A.D., and this church is called the Red One because they're soaking in their own blood. And, of course, this time they're not getting their persecution from pagan Rome. They're getting their persecution from papal Rome. Readers of church histories are familiar with the period. And, again, Fox's Book of Martyrs by Forbish is excellent reading matter that will describe the terrible suffering during these times of the Huguenots and the Wild Engines and the Albigensians as papal Rome, the Nicolaitan conquerors, sent forth at times even armies to wipe out whole towns that had preserved the true Texas Receptus from Antioch of Syria. And these battles and wars and persecutions are legendary. They're recorded in any reliable church history, and it's useless for opponents of the truth to argue with them. No argument can be made with history. You have to face history. The facts are the facts. He says about this church, Thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. This was a dead church yet it had a reputation for being a live church. And many churches in America are that way today. The Methodists have a name, but are they alive? The Baptists have a name, but are they alive? The Presbyterians have a name, but are they alive? Lutherans profess to follow Martin Luther. What do you suppose Martin Luther would think of the average Lutheran church in America if he were to return today? The Methodists talk about John Wesley. How do you suppose John Wesley would feel about the First Methodist Church in your hometown? I think sometimes he probably dropped dead of a heart attack before he got by the fifth ashtray, don't you? Don't you think so? Why, Spurgeon was hailed, is still being hailed by Baptists as one of the greatest Baptists that ever lived. Did you know at the time that Spurgeon lived, he was persecuted mercilessly by the Baptist brethren in England in one of the greatest church splits the Baptists ever had? Did you know he was persecuted for his old-fashioned biblical stand? And they have a statue of Charles Haddon Spurgeon in the narthex of the British Museum right now, and yet in his day, brother, they garnished his sepulcher. You have a name, but you're dead. As someone has written, outwardly splendid as of old, inwardly lifeless, empty and cold, her force and fire all spent and gone, like the dead moon, she still shines on. And many a church that was an organism became merely an organization. Many churches are like an ailing lung with a few cells uh, doing the breathing. And the real life in them is just a few spirit-filled believers who keep the church from becoming an animated corpse. This is the condition of the church at Sardis. And of course, this condition cannot continue. And now in verse 7, we hit the greatest period of history the church has ever seen or ever will see. 
As a matter of fact, if you read the verses carefully, you'll find the church in Philadelphia, Revelation 3, 7, is the only period of church history where the Lord had nothing critical to say about the church. There is a rebuke in every epistle written to the seven churches in Asia except the angel of the church in Philadelphia. The word Philadelphia, of course, means brotherly love. And this is the church of the open door, verse 8. And I call your attention to the salient fact that this is the only church that kept God's word. Did you notice that? Did you notice that? The church at Ephesus labored and was patient and did the works and did the labor and didn't faint. But the Philadelphia church kept my word. Verse 8. And at this period of church history, that was the greatest period of church history, as I have said before, the world will ever see, there'll be nothing like it again. For the church period that follows this period is called the church of Laodicea, verse 14. And the word Laodicea is from Laos and Dikios, the rights of the people, civil rights, the rights of the common man. The principles of the Laodicean church is liberty, equality, fraternity. That is, it's the profession of Karl Marx and Engels. The profession of the church in Revelation 3, 7 is, we Christians love each other, let's go through the door God opens and put out the word. And that's the difference. This period of church history plainly begins with the Reformation. Martin Luther, 1520, and slams shut in 1901 and 1904 when two disastrous things happened to the body of Christ. The first of these was the adoption of the American people, by the American people, of the West Cotton Hort Greek text from Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, the most corrupt text known on the face of the earth, and the rejection of the King James Bible by the British Foreign Missionary Society, 1904, and their acceptance of Nestle's text, Greek text, as a basis for translations on the mission field. And with these two foolish, disastrous errors, the doors close, and the church of today is the church of the shut door that has not kept his word. But at the Philadelphia period, all things were different, and time would fail me to even begin to describe the period. You couldn't possibly describe it. This is the period of Martin Luther. This is the period where the Bible was translated from the Texas Receptus into Norwegian, uh, Dutch, Belgian, French, Spanish, Italian, Romanian, Slovakian, Chinese, and Japanese, even before the time of the King James Bible. This Greek Texas Receptus published by Erasmus is the basis for all future Receptus publications, and from these comes the purified text of the King James, which went to the ends of the earth under Queen Victoria. It was an authorized King James version that came to America and was preached in Georgia, South Carolina, Virginia, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Vermont, New Hampshire, New England, Maryland, and New York and New Jersey by George Whitfield, Gilbert Tennant, Frillinghausen and Jonathan Edwards. It was a King James Bible that David Brainerd took out to the Indians to translate into their language. It was a King James Bible that Eliot translated into the language of his Indians that he preached to. It was a King James 1611 authorized version that was used in the Great Awakening, in the revival that followed the Second Great Awakening, in the Cumberland Valley Revival, and in all the revivals that followed under Charles G. Finney, Dwight L. Moody, Sam Jones, and the missionary work of David Livingston, Carey, Goforth, C.T. Studd, Adoniram Judson, Hudson Taylor, Henry Martin, Francis Gardner, John Patton, and off to the ends of the earth. 
The Indians and the islands of Patagonia were converted by this book. The natives and the headhunters and cannibals of New Zealand and the New Hebrides were converted by this book. The man who washed ashore on the island of Pickern out there after mutiny on the bounty transported with him a King James Bible that turned the whole island into a Christian community in less than a hundred years. This was the church that kept his word. And as long as they kept his word, God so blessed his promises so blessed his people that many of them thought the kingdom was coming and revived the ancient post-millennial heresy of Augustine's city of God. And you could hardly blame them. It was during this time that Brahms, Bach, and Beethoven showed up. It was during this time that Columbus discovered America. It was during this time that Magellan sailed around the world. This is the period of Vasco da Gama and Cortez and Ponce de Leon and Balboa, and Henry Hudson, and De Soto. This is the period of the uh, American Revolution. This is the period of the French Revolution. This is the period of the Napoleonic Wars. This the, is, the, is the Industrial Revolution. This is when electricity showed up. This is when the steam engine showed up. This is when the great painters showed up, the great musicians, the great writers. This was the heyday of the world. And it was produced by the preaching of a King James 1611 A.V. to the ends of the earth under an empire of such vast extent that it was a common saying, the sun never sets on the British Empire and Britannica rules the waves. Someone has said, England made this Bible, but this Bible made England. This is the church of the open door. I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. And because thou hast kept the word of my patience, verse 10, I will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. And that hour followed the Philadelphia church period. In it came. In 1881, a couple of scholars got on an English revision committee named Westcott and Hort. They brought with them Dr. Philip Schaff, who served in both the American and English committee, and a man named Lightfoot. And these men replaced the authorized King James text with a Greek text that came from Eusebius, Origen, and Vaticanus by means of the 1582 Reims Jesuit Bible. This was accepted by the Englishmen in 1881, accepted by the Americans in 1901, and there followed two world wars that bankrupted England and put America in a position where she couldn't beat a country the size of Georgia in eight years of bloody fighting. Ichabod, the glory hath departed. And the last church at the end of the church age is not an evangelistic church dedicated to the word of God and revival and missionary work. The last church we now come upon in our book, Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, is a church engaged in writing social injustices, pushing forward the common man to take over property, and establishing a socialistic, communistic form of government on the face of this earth where God has no rights, verse 20, and Jesus Christ is shut outside the door. And this is the end of the church age. This period begins around 1900, 1901, 1904, and you are now in the middle of the last period of church history. You're in the middle of a period that saw the last few witnesses get on their feet and do the job. And every one of them, mark my words, every one of them that got on his feet and did the job was trained by a man who kept the Word of God. Harry Ironsides, J. Frank Norris, Mordecai Ham, Gypsy Smith, Billy Sunday, Percy Crawford, Jack Wilson, Dr. DeHaan, Theodore Epps, 
Charlie Fuller, Beach and Vic, John Rawlins, Harold Henniger, Art Wilson, John R. Rice, Lee Robertson, Harvey Springer, every one of them was trained by a man who believed and taught and preached the authorized King James 1611 Bible. And they shine as lights in the last few years, the darkness of this age that's going to end, according to our passage before us, in total apostasy. And as the whole nation falls away, the whole world falls away. America is the last great bastion of missionary activity. And over 80%, listen to me, over 80% of all the money received on the foreign field for mission work comes from one country. And that country spends less on missions than it does on whiskey, tobacco, and heroin. You're at the jumping off place. And as we close this side of our record, volume number three, we approach the last church in the church age. And when this church disappears, in chapter 4, verse 1, John is caught out, and he has shown the events that take place in the Great Tribulation. Now, I will study this church, this last Laodicean church, in greater detail when we get to side 1 of volume 4, the next study in this series of studies in the book of Revelation. There won't be time on the remainder of this side to go into this church and a detailed discussion of its activities as this is one of the most important churches among the seven, and of course the church that you should be primarily interested in, because this church is the church of your day and age and your generation. To be absolutely truthful about it, you're about uh, two-thirds of the way through the period represented by this church, not halfway through, as I mentioned earlier, and two-thirds of the period would take you to about the year 1966. And up here around 1970 and 71, we're in the last third of the last quarter of the last half of the church age. We're nearing the end. And this is apparent from the detailed information given to us in Revelation 3 on the Laodicean church. It is the church of the closed door, the church of the unfaithful ones who have rejected the word. It is the church of the lukewarm, the compromising group that are synthesized and integrated in the middle of the road in their attitude toward absolute truth. They're neither cold, that is, they're neither completely dead and liberal, and they're not hot, they're not fervent in spirit, and serving the Lord, they're not stirred up, they're just in the middle, they're just lukewarm. And the Lord has a great deal to say about this church when he says this church is poor, wretched, miserable, naked, and blind even though it thinks it's rich and increased with goods and has need of nothing, he is stating some great truths that every Christian in this age needs to know something about. And so, as I said before, on side one of the next volume, we'll take up our study, which will complete our study of the message of the seven churches and take us clear through the first three chapters in the book of Revelation. After finishing the final message of the final church, the Laodicean church, we'll get into the material that deals with the great tribulation itself, the time of Jacob's troubles that will take place after the church is caught out and this earth is abandoned to its own ways and the fruit of its own doings. This period of unparalleled trouble will take place after the church leaves, and as I've said before, it's called the time of Jacob's troubles or the great tribulation. And this time of trouble is going to be a time of trouble like as there never was up to this time, nor indeed shall be, if we are to believe the Lord Jesus Christ in his words given in Matthew chapter 24. So here we close the third volume in our series of studies in the book of Revelation. Our next volume will take up our study of the last message of the last of the seven churches and get into the studies that deal with the Great Tribulation.